On a sun-drenched field outside the village of Sala, Duke Folk of Anjou found his company of loyal troops surrounded by the menace of the north, the army of Duke Robert. His court in Anjou was full of these Norman bullies already, as he was to witness personally. In chains, he was dragged into his own home, to the feet of the self-styled Saviour of Anjou. Not only could Robert claim to have defeated the Manticore of Brej, but now he had rid the locals of Folk the Cruel. Let the tyranny of House Anjou be cast away, and the… something else of House Normandy begin. With such words, Robert accepted Falk's sword point surrender, swept the coronet from the captive's head, and plopped it atop his own. With that simple motion, the Danjou dynasty was consumed. With enough gold, he could arrange for the Duchy of Anjou to be formally re-established as his own property, which would have the exciting consequence of making Robert a double duke. But money was short and selling the Anjou coronet would take away his new badge of office. No, coin would have to be saved for a far more furtive investment. Robert's eyes turned north, gazing across the choppy grey sea that separated him from his birthright. His father's legacy was to be squeezed to the last drop, and before Robert there was now an open door, held ajar by a grinning joker, for the English had thrown off the oppression of Norway. The Anglo-Saxons ruled again, kindly warming Robert's throne for him as he prepared the ultimate sales pitch. He needed the army of King Philip to stand a chance of clearing his plate of all England. Said King was already far along the road of being convinced thanks to the silky tales of valour brushed over the ears of the High Court by Gerbeau. The Normans had saved France from disaster countless times, it came to be believed, and it was even said that Robert had personally saved the life of the King by way of his role as the royal cupbearer, keenly dowsing out a poisoned wine that he almost certainly hadn't planted himself. Yet all this was distastefully coloured by the jokes of Frankish nobles regarding the unsophisticated accents of the Normandy region, and, more worryingly, their connection to those brutish Germans and Norse folk that were thought to be plotting against the civilised peoples of France even still. It was a fear cajoled by those whom the fear benefited, with little real basis, for in fact Normans and Franks were near identical in their practices, language and ambition. The similarity was such that Robert could begin to call himself French with no work whatsoever, his favourite amount. So he did, claiming to the French High Court that in order to further unify the realm of his esteemed king, he would no longer recognise the distinction of Norman from the other Frankish groups. To fight for Normandy was to fight for all France, he insisted. This ploy is thought to have impressed the French court as Robert had hoped. However, the usual disregard for the views of his subjects now returned to mire his bold strides, as it always did. Opening the grand door into the hall of Rouen Castle, any applause for his progressive attack on social divides was drowned out by the cries, screams, shouts and general clattering of overturned tables all originating from some very angry Normans. Apparently, to betray the heritage of all the noble families in the duchy and side with those who had always looked down their noses upon Norman kind was not a very popular move. Robert tried to explain that it was a ruse aimed at using Frankish power to further Norman ambitions. Perhaps in the calm quiet of a walk through the gardens, the point would have landed but amid the bustle of this finely dressed rabble, the point was torn up, corrupted and regurgitated into a barrage of accusations. Robert was lying so freely about a matter that close to heart? What else was a lie? His father would have trusted in Norman strength alone, and given no debt to the sneering Franks of Paris. While they were at it, complaints high and low were thrown out to fry in each other's juices, bringing long heated issues to the boil. Finally, the chaos was brought under control by the arrival of Robert's military marshal, William of Evreux. 
Each clanking step he took was echoed by his sword, loosely gripped in the sheath it was already partially drawn from. A man of military mind would surely see things Robert's way. The Duke stood from the throne he had cowered on and opened his arms to welcome William. William stopped short of the stubby embrace and cleared his throat. He declared that he, William of Evreux, would fight to see the rightful Duke of Normandy, William of Vendôme, installed on the moist throne before them. Oh dear. The other nobles, would be Duke William included, started gathering around the marshal. Oh dear. Landowners started pledging to serve the duo of Williams in this cause, amounting to several thousand men's worth of levy being set against Robert's war-weary counties. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. After the list of indictments was concluded, Marshal William looked to the Duke for an answer to his request. Robert slowly removed his father's golden headpiece, placed it on the slippery wood of the throne, and shuffled into the dark corners of the hall behind him, where a small door gave him exit to the stairs below his chamber. Throughout, his face was smiling, his movements careful and deliberate, and the crowd silent. As soon as the door clanked shut, a cheer arose in the hall, and Robert sprinted up the stairs in a display of fitness unknown to his story so far, and tragically witnessed by none. Plenty witnessed the displays he put on in the days and weeks to come, though. Maids heard him bawling in his room. Guards encountered him slashing at moonlit sacks of hay in the quad. And the court of Normandy saw him playing dead at the opposite end of the table from Duke William. Robert still had to be there, for he was still Count of Maine, Rouen and Anjou, making him the most powerful man in the duchy. For now, a snivelling corpse, hanging on to claims that he was French now anyway so didn't have to listen to William, would stand in for this prestigious arc count. Recovering from this drawn-out episode would take the better part of the year 1090. Robert's young Swedish wife bowed out of her futile attempts to comfort her husband, disappearing off to seek God in a nunnery, and leaving Robert to be comforted more successfully by his old girlfriend, Adeline, the peasant regent of Rouen. In May, Robert received a visit from his brother, Richard. Richard's gullibility had made him fond of the legendary Robert of Maine, and now he had a strong reason to make peace with the real one. William was the youngest of the Normandy brothers, and so in elevating him to Duke, the nobles had passed over the more legitimate choice of Richard. The two elder siblings realised they were of one mind when it came to little William. He had to be punished, and the position of Duke needed to be made vacant once again. So it was that Robert bonded with an estranged sibling over a murder plot targeting another estranged sibling. It was simply that sort of family. It will come as no surprise then that it was also the sort of family where all the happy overtones of kin slaying were laced with deceit. Robert discovered that Richard was beginning to rally nobles to support him for a direct usurpation, just as William had done. The race was on. The barons of the land opened their doors one day to the dashing figure of Richard with all his heraldic regalia, speaking of the glories he would win for Normandy if only the scrawny William was retired to a more suitable role. The next day it was Robert, stains on his tunic and salt in his fingernails, banging tables, saying the word mine a lot, and asking to take a nap in their bed. Neither tactic worked, as it happened, for the nobles of the land currently had a ruler who wasn't levying half their tenants for years on end, which was ultimately the catch at the bottom of both elder brothers' manifestos. It came to be midway through 1091, and still no one had got bored of Duke William's peaceful ways. Robert, though, had fully recovered from the lows of the previous year, and in fact could be said to have rebounded in a spectacular fashion. For suddenly he was the one standing before the Duke in his best power pose, demanding that his titles be returned to him. If William refused, it would mean war, 
a war as difficult to win as the one Robert shied away from the January before last, and William did refuse. Shocked that Robert was seriously doing this, the duchy slipped into civil war. By this time, Robert had passed Anjou off to an old general, so he had only men from Maine and Rouen to fight with. William had the men of Vendôme, a thousand in total, who quickly marched to engage the 500 in Maine. There were also troops contributed by the Norman vassals, but luckily for Robert, these were few. The fact that no one really wanted to fight was working in Robert's favour. A couple of hundred men gambled on joining his 700 men from Rouen, and suddenly William had a real contest on his hands. Two small battles took place in Maine and Evreux respectively, with both playing almost exactly the same but with the roles reversed, one win for Robert and one for William. Then, all the Norman loyalists converged on Evreux for the decisive engagement. They had a solid advantage in numbers, and were led by veteran Norman commanders, including the man who knew the land best of all, William of Evreux. Robert's men were in trouble, so obviously that no one wanted to take command of the army, save for Robert, and no one wanted that either. In the hour of need, a horseman approached the camp in blackened garb, his face hidden by a hood. The troops recoiled at the sight. Was this the legendary spectre of death, seen only when one's life was at its end? There was no scythe, and besides, it was heading straight for Robert's tent, so maybe it was just a personal visit. It was, in a way, but not by the spirit of death. It was Orderic. The man who had guided Robert as a troublesome teen, and the man who had stained his honour to get Robert Vendôme, the very land now standing opposed to him. That evening he appeared once more to serve his old ward like a guardian spirit. He also brought a rare cheese, into which Robert tucked with unbridled enthusiasm before the nostalgic gaze of the old master. Orderic promised to rescue Robert from the dire straits he had sailed, and after sufficient badgering, also promised to reveal where the cheese was made for future reference. The tutor was given full command of Robert's 900 troops, which he took to a river near Lisieux. There, the loyalists had to make an awkward crossing into his prepared lines, about which they were none too pleased. In fact, William's right flank decided that traipsing through weed-filled water while arrows rained upon them was not worth the effort. They called off their attack as soon as it had begun. The odds were evened. Extra troops could be stationed on the banks in front of Marshal William, whose zeal drove his men all the way across and into a bloody melee. Waterlogged gear, an exposed flank, and the broken promise that the rebels would simply flee brought the loyalist offensive to a standstill. They lost two men for every rebel they slew in a muddy uphill battle, and in this fashion their will to fight was expended. Robert's rebels had avoided destruction, but more importantly they had shown the duchy that Robert had a chance to actually follow through on his childish claims. Both sides had about equal numbers, and both armies were gathering near the traditional battlefield of Blois for a formal pitched engagement. Without much delay, the contest began. The rebels, now led by Commander Raoul from Maine, focused much of their strength on their flanks, while Marshal William concentrated his men in his centre. The two formations were each other's mutual weakness, which meant when the lines clashed, it was a slaughter. Robert's centre broke under the weight of William's charge, but both of William's flanks were pushed off the field entirely. The effort of doing this shattered the rebel right, leaving only two groups of 400 or so men on the field, one under Orderic, the other under Marshal William. William was considered a mighty commander, leading from the front and fighting side by side with his troops to inspire from them great deeds. Orderic was not known for his machismo, but more for his craft. What hope did he have to win? Well, there is craft to be had in battle also. He kept his men in neat order, contrasting the mixed blob of a formation that William's men had ended up in during the fighting. The sight was unnerving to the loyalists. 
How was this band of rebels so disciplined? Furthermore, how were they advancing right towards them without rest? Orderic had a good eye. Not only had he determined that a box beats a blob of equal strength in the minds of men, but he determined the exact angle and timing required from his archers to hit the loyalists with a volley of arrows just seconds before his infantry delivered a charge. With tight coordination, he unleashed the missiles at a high angle. The arrival of the arrows made William's men raise their shields up over their heads, before moments later a wall of spears, axes, halberds and swords dug into their fronts. Two in ten loyalists were dead twenty seconds into the fighting. The rest did not stay to see how things would continue from such a beginning. Robert and company followed the fleeing loyalists north to Amiens, where another short battle was won. It seemed that Robert had truly proven himself as the rightful ruler of Normandy. The King of France was positively enamoured with the drama, casting away his doubts about the unjustly unpopular Norman convert. But remember, this is the ill-fated Robert of Maine we're talking about, member of the conniving Normandy dynasty. There was no way things could end so well, and indeed they didn't. With the Loyalist force destroyed, along with half of Robert's men, Richard rose up to stake his claim to the duchy. He had 2,000 fresh troops, already positioned in key areas for his usurpation. He was more popular than Robert, and more legitimate than William. In the high towers of Paris, they heard a ghostly scream in the night. A curse had been wrought upon a lost soul, to be sure. But, at that moment, before the abyss, Robert would be gifted a way to make everything right again. <laughs>